Okay, so welcome everyone. Um, my name is Stephanie McClarty and I'm a project officer at the Canadian Public Health Association and I'll be the moderator for the webinar. So great to see a lot of names on here. I know that people have got some some tips in there. So we'll just move on to, um, to Leela. So Leela Steiner is an environmental health and knowledge translation scientist at the National Collaborating Centre for Environmental Health. She has a background in chemical management, science policy, and regulatory frameworks for emerging contaminants. At the NCCEH, Leela is the lead on the cannabis and environmental health file and has focused on risk communication and personal cultivation. She is also currently a Bridge Fellow at the University of British Columbia. Her recent research has included work on endocrine disrupting compounds, food contact materials, and the science policy interface. So with that, I would like to turn the webinar over to Leela to get started. Thanks very much, Stephanie. Uh, thank you all for coming uh, to the webinar today. Uh, I am going to talk about a little bit of a different topic than uh, generally what CPH is focused on in terms of consumption and conversation. Um, but this is a perfect moment for me to plug that we also do quite a bit of work at the NCCH on risk communication in the context of cannabis. and. Um, there will be a paper out hopefully in the next week uh, in environmental health review that focuses specifically on how we talk about cannabis and the kinds of conversations that public health could be having about it. Um, so if that is a topic that is of interest to you outside of the environmental health stuff, uh, please do let me know and I can um, queue up with that work. But today I'm going to talk about uh, the health and safety concerns for personal cannabis cultivation. Before I get started, uh, just to give you a little background in case uh, not everybody knows uh, who we are and what we do. Uh, the Public Health Agency of Canada uh, created these six collaborating centers in 2005 to promote the use of knowledge and evidence by uh, different public health practitioners and policymakers around the country. Um, we are one of those six. There is methods and tools, Aboriginal health, infectious disease, healthy public policy, determinants of health, and then us, the National Collaborating Center for Environmental Health. So that's where our focus uh, comes from. Our mandate is threefold, uh, and this is just because I want to give you a context for who our audience generally is and in the type of work that we put together. Um, we do attempt to pull together knowledge, uh, synthesize it, exchange it, um, bring evidence from different pieces of research, from government uh, resources as well as from the academic uh, sphere to help people improve uh, the development of policy. We also do try to identify gaps so that we can inform researchers of, of what is most needed in different public health realms. And then part of our third mandate is building capacity, which is to say we do try to connect people who are working on different types of projects across the country, um, give them tools, uh, let them know who's working on what, um, so that we can have a little bit of a closer network and, and foster some partnerships and collaboration. Um, I do need to say that uh, we do not have any financial interest in the cannabis industry, and I specifically don't have any interest in the cannabis industry going forward. So all of the, the work that we do is kind of devoid of that um, industry lens. So I want to talk quickly about how we got into this topic. Uh, there was a lot of media coverage about some cannabis-related explosions, uh, which I will talk about at the end of the presentation. Uh, but specifically, several fire departments actually contacted us because uh, they were looking for information about the types of hazards that might actually be encountered when fighting these types of fires. Uh, this led us to begin to synthesize knowledge related to different types of environmental health risks that might be found in home grows. And so we framed a couple of questions um, going forward on the project to give a little bit of a scope to what we wanted to find. Uh, first, what environmental health hazards are associated with cannabis cultivation, processing, or use at any stage? Uh, how will legalization <coughs> affect the extent, scale, and conditions under which cannabis is cultivated, either in commercial or personal settings? And what measures can actually be implemented to reduce exposures uh, throughout all those different phases of growing? What we came up with is basically this scope. These are the five key environmental health risks that uh, are, are encountered, and it's what I'm going to be talking about today. Um, access and accidental poisoning, pesticide use, indoor air quality, electrical and fire hazards, and then radiation hazards. Um, as, which, and those uh, electrical and fire hazards do include those explosion hazards that I mentioned, uh, which is what the fire departments were particularly interested in. Uh, as we go along, I'm also going to talk about some policy considerations that are relevant to each of these environmental health risks so that we can think about how we might want to design proactive interventions. Um, and once I've gone over all of these things, we're going to switch gears because I want to close with a brief discussion of risk communication in the context of cannabis. We'll just have two slides on the end uh, just to quickly go over some key points there. 
So something I'm not going to talk about is health effects uh, from consumption, okay? If that's something you're interested in, uh, this is the point I want to point you towards this document here, um, which is a really fantastic strength of evidence uh, report from the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine. Um, it's now like a year and a half old, but it's still fantastic because it does rate health evidence um, in kind of the spectrum of insufficient to limited, moderate, substantial, conclusive, and that is really helpful when you're trying to present. Um, evidence on health effects of using cannabis. So I'm going to point you towards this if you are interested in that. Uh, and we also have a whole bunch of other resources on our cannabis topic page uh, online. So if you're looking for a whole bunch of stuff outside of the, the EH risks, um, that is where I'm going to direct you. So let's get some context to this situation. Um, commercial operations in Canada, they're generally medium to large in scale. Um, and those kinds of size issues are going to have an effect on the kinds of environmental health risks that I'm going to talk about. So it's definitely important to keep that in mind. Um, as I've noted on the slide, there are 67 active licenses for medical growers in Canada at the moment. Um, unlike in home growth situations, they are subject to inspection and oftentimes sporadic testing. Um, so it's not consistent, but there is something going on there, which is not the case for home growing. Um, when we talk about personal cultivation, uh, Bill C-45, C-45, sorry, uh, did include a limit of four budding plants per household. Uh, but as I'm sure you can imagine, this is pretty difficult to regulate and enforce. So the likelihood of overproduction is, is quite high. Um, and there's also currently limited guidance on how people can actually grow, process, and dispose safely. Uh, so that's one of the issues here and, and a factor that's going to contribute to whether there are EH risks exacerbated or whether we can mitigate them a bit. There's also no reason to believe, based on evidence that we have from the states that have legalized uh, down south, that illegal grubs are going to go away um, at, during the course of this legalization experience uh, because they haven't gone away uh, down south in those U.S. states that have legalized. So I want to turn to our first environmental health risk. Um, it's not all surprising, uh, I'm sure, to most of you that having cannabis plants, products, and waste in the home does increase the risk that children, pets, and uh, unaware adults can inadvertently consume cannabis with uh, detrimental effects. So the combo of having uh, personal cultivation legalized and the lack of an in-home possession limit does mean that you can accumulate significant quantities of cannabis. Um, it's partly why some public health safety organizations have recommended kind of a precautionary ban on personal cultivation. Quebec and Manitoba uh, are two of those jurisdictions, so growing at home uh, has been uh, prohibited there. Uh, in terms of the in-home possession limit, BC in the last couple months has decided to put an in-home uh, limit on possession, which is something like 1,000 grams, I think. Um, so you can kind of weigh the pros and cons of that and whether you think 1,000 grams actually does much of uh, anything in terms of curtailing the uh, possibility to accumulate, especially when nobody is going in to check that at a regular uh, interval. But um, certainly there have been strides to curtail that uh, in some regions. In terms of accidental poisoning, um, poison control center data has been a really valuable means to track the impact of increased cannabis availability. Uh, in the U.S., poison center and hospital admission data has also actively been used to track the impact on children specifically. Um, what's come up from that data is that the ingestion of cannabis resin, so hashish, which is what I put on the slide, uh, was more common actually than things like edibles um, that were cookies or candies. And so just as many children have become intoxicated from ingesting those types of waste products or uh, like unprocessed um, products used generally for smoking or consumption for adults than they have been with edibles, which is surprising to most people. Um, there's a few reasons for this. I'm sure you can all imagine what this on the slide also looks like, which is chocolate. So it's certainly something to keep in mind when we're putting together different types of products uh, and what their general appeal level might be. Um, second is that Childproof packaging is often used for edible products, and adults are usually a little bit more diligent about storing them. So uh, if you have cannabis products in the home and you know that they're there, you're, you're more likely to put cookies and candies in a cupboard, whereas you might not assume that your child would put an unfinished joint in their mouth. But the Poison Control Center's tell, data tells us that actually kids are just as likely um, to eat both of those things. It's because they're weirdly curious and they put everything in their mouth, so I don't think we should necessarily be surprised by this, but it is something to keep in mind. A good example of this is Kellen. This is my dog. He's an English Cocker Spaniel who loves to eat all things. Um, and one week after our paper on this topic came out, a friend of ours took him 
uh, hiking, so she took him the night before she went. She left him alone in the morning uh, before she took a shower. One of her roommates had left a cannabis cookie on the table. Uh, it was in its package, it was in its bag, and he ate the bag, the package, and the cookie. Don't worry, he's fine. That's not his regular, like, emergency room face. That's his just everyday face. Um, he survived, but actually one cookie is about the equivalent of six doses for an adult human, and he weighs just over about 25 pounds. Um, so for most dogs, that would actually have been fatal, and we didn't actually know what had happened until eight hours later when they found a few bits of the bag. Uh, so it's one of those moments when you really do have to pay attention to the fact that every product that you keep in your home can potentially be accessible, and, and dogs and children are going to put those kinds of things in their mouths at every time they get a chance. So what are some policy considerations uh, for access and accidental poisoning? Um, first, we do need to promote safe practices for cannabis plants, products, and waste, all of those things in the home. It really does mean a lot of public education uh, on safe and thoughtful management of cannabis and waste. A second critical point is the promotion and support of those poison control centers. They do play an invaluable role uh, in providing immediate anonymous advice on cannabis poisoning. I myself felt very lucky I did not have to call the Poison Control Center uh, here at the BCCDC and disguise my voice um, And when I was asking potentially about what to do with uh, my dog. And, and, but the thing is, many people do call in, and uh, there has been an increase in calls uh, both here and within uh, the states that have legalized to the Poison Control Centers, uh, which is good because it means people feel comfortable reporting. Um, but it does mean that we do have to support them uh, with resources and with enough capacity to be able to respond. They also play a pretty important role for physicians and emergency departments that can benefit from the resource if they aren't familiar with different signs of cannabis intoxication. Third, we do need some surveillance because it will help us to better understand how and to whom these poisonings are occurring. Um, one idea that's been floated is that we could require physicians and hospitals to report cannabis intoxication to provincial health agencies, kind of the way that they do for opioid overdose reporting just in terms of a data collection method. Um, so it's definitely something to consider as we go forward. Um, and finally, it is essential that provisions are made for waste disposal, uh, something that's particularly relevant to municipalities uh, as we go forward. For medical cannabis users at the moment, uh, or rather, sorry, not at the moment, previously Health Canada has recommended blending waste material with water, mixing it with cat litter, and then disposing of it in the trash. But depending on the scale of personal production in a community and, and different local policies on organic material and municipal waste, it's definitely going to be necessary to kind of either provide alternative disposal options um, that are in line with local recycling and waste procedures or be clearer uh, at a local level about what is and is not allowed um, in terms of disposing of things in your trash and organic bins because uh, that plant material is certainly something that contributes to access issues. Um, and once it leaves your home and, and people uh, walking down the street have access to it, if it's not disposed of correctly, like that, that's possibly um, another uh, area where there could be risk. So let's move on to the second big environmental health risk, and that's indoor air quality. So humidity is a big issue with cannabis, uh, both because poor humidity control can allow a fungus to grow on the plant, uh, but also because it can create a mold issue in the home itself. So um, that's problematic for a couple reasons. First, because growers can then resort to using chemicals to control the situation, which I'll talk about in a minute, uh, but mostly because of the humidity in the home. Um, the young plants actually need high humidity to survive until they can develop their own root system. So they start out needing about 70% humidity, and then over time, that can decrease to about 40%. But once you have a bunch of mature rooted plants, those plants themselves may start to cause a humidity problem because one mature plant produces as much moisture as about seven tropical plants. So when you think about then four plants as the limit in the home, uh, that's about 28 tropical plants usually grown in one room together. Uh, and I'm, I'm sure you can imagine that that creates a moisture burden in that room and in the home in general. Uh, growers and, and illicit growers in the past have tried to seal the moisture in. Uh, in many cases, it's because they do realize that they need that humidity to get the plants going, um, and also it helps control the temperature. But it also helps control odors, which is how illicit growers have often been caught in the past. So both of those issues are problematic when you compound it with the fact that uh, Canadian homes are winterized uh, to be energy efficient, which means that they're pretty airtight and, and uh, they have relatively low ventilation rates. All of these things together, it means that a few plants can increase the moisture burden. Uh, 
And in fact, one modeling study has found that as, as few as four plants could create a humidity issue in a home and, and lead to mold. The second indoor air quality issue is the odors, and there is a lot of uh, talk about this, especially a lot of questions about whether there are any actual environmental health risks from this. For a bit of background, uh, cannabis odors, they come from a kind of complex mixture of hundreds of different volatile compounds that are produced alongside the odorless cannabinoids in the resinous secretion bit of the flower. That's because, so, so actually odors increase with flowering and then might also intensify during the drying, curing, and processing stages since the, all the oils then become volatilized into the air. Um, these odors are going to be subjectively more or less pleasant depending on who you ask, but there's actually no evidence to date that suggests that the odors are specifically detrimental to human health. Um, there was a, a good uh, short evidence review put out by Public Health Ontario last summer um, that went through this evidence to, to, to conclude that actually there's not much to be concerned with. Um, however, they do mention that, as with any strong odor, it, it can be argued that odor itself impacts well-being through annoyance, disruption, and stress. So that is something to keep in mind um, when you're talking to people about this air quality issue. The third air quality issue uh, is carbon monoxide. So carbon monoxide is a hazardous byproduct uh, in this context uh, of uh, propane or natural gas powered carbon dioxide generators or burners, which are sometimes used to enhance plant growth and increase yield of the plant. We've also found that ignition devices can create explosion hazards if there's a fire due to the presence of compressed gas. Some people uh, engage in other hazardous practices uh, that lead to CO2, which includes venting their furnaces or water heaters directly into the grow room to increase CO2 for the plants. I'm sure you can all imagine why this is problematic, um, but it's certainly something that we should keep in mind as, as one of the air quality risks uh, in indoor grows. So when it comes to indoor air quality generally, there are a few policy interventions that can have an impact on environmental health. Um, first, limit plant numbers. Um, because impacts on the indoor air quality do scale up with the number of plants, low plant limits should help to minimize risks from growers, but as I mentioned, it is going to be impossible to enforce and, and uh, overgrow growth is considered to be quite likely, so having those limits alone isn't going to mitigate any of these indoor air quality issues. I've put on the slide photos to illustrate the size difference um, between a young seedling uh, and a fully mature plant. Even that image on the right doesn't give it full credit. So it does. these plants do grow to be quite tall, like corn stalk size, but much, much bushier. So when you plant a seed and you get these cute little seedlings right at the beginning, uh, it becomes a serious agricultural endeavor inside your home once you have four plants in there. Um, and I, I, many people don't quite realize this when they embark on growing uh, small plants for, for uh, novelty sake. A second thing that we could do uh, is grow outside of the home. Um, several provinces have indicated that they will permit outdoor open air growing on private property. I think the Yukon is one of them, uh, although this does increase the risk of theft and might exacerbate odor complaints. So there's kind of a back and forth in the region about whether or not this is worth it because it minimizes a lot of uh, air quality issues inside um, or that because it exacerbates some outdoor issues uh, that it should be restricted. Third, people might want to consider the use of indoor air cleaners. Um, however, and this is kind of a big however, these types of air filtration units are typically pretty limited in their ability to capture mold spores. Uh, and to date, they haven't, uh, there haven't been any formal evaluations of the efficiency of portable air filtration units or air cleaners in the context of indoor cannabis cultivation. So those those studies haven't been done, um, there's not enough as a evidence really to warrant suggesting that this is the way to go, um, but it is certainly uh, something to consider. Finally, we do want to discourage people to, uh, using ignition devices indoors under any circumstances. Um, Gas-powered CO2 generators are readily available in Canada, and they're also used outside the home in green, greenhouses, for instance. So uh, banning the sale of these devices are going to be pretty challenging. Uh, Sacramento County did ban the use of CO2 generators in indoor grows, but um, it's unclear in any of their regulations how the ban is going to be enforced. Um, so there's not really much point in banning a, a device that can be bought um, basically at Canadian Tire or anywhere else uh, if there's no plan in place to regulate. Okay, let's turn to the next EH risk. Um, as with all types of gardeners, uh, and I'm definitely one of them, 
uh, cannabis cultivators have to deal with common insects, such as spiders, mice, aphids, attacking the plant. Um, these are, of course, not a health risk to themselves, the pests, but any pesticides sprayed on the plants to control them may very well be a risk. There are a couple of issues uh, with pesticides and pest management. Uh, the first is that cultivation conditions can make cannabis susceptible to pests which is to say they're in a small room, there's lots of plants, the humidity is high, it's sealed in, there's not a lot of ventilation, um, there's not a lot of room to move, those kinds of uh, conditions is, is what I'm talking about there. Um, and because the mold or blight or a pest can quickly wipe out a crop, there is a pretty strong financial incentive for producers to use potent options um, to solve that, solve that problem in quotations, I guess. The second issue, which is specific to the U.S., um, but is relevant in, in some way, uh, is that cannabis is federally still prohibited. So the federal regulatory agencies like the EPA, FDA, and USDA, they're not getting involved in this, which means that there are no EPA-registered pesticides for cannabis in the U.S., which means that those formal risk assessments are not getting done. Um, so that's certainly uh, an area that needs improvement um, and would inform a lot of our practice as well. And it certainly would be more beneficial uh, in the states if those, if those uh, reviews were being done. The situation in Canada is a bit different. We are, because we've legalized across Canada and we do have regulatory agencies, specifically Health Canada and the Pest Management Regulatory Agency, that have already done quite a bit of work on pest control for medical cannabis. We are extrapolating a little bit from there. Um, there are 20 pesticides registered for use on medical cannabis, and they include a kind of a mix of oils salters, detergents, biological controls, via bacteria that kind of leave an insecticidal toxin on the plant. Um, however, these are all pretty innocuous, and the risks are not very high if growers have used them a little bit. Um, however, even though those options are available, there's no synthetics on the list, which means that there is a concern that if a grower is faced with a catastrophic loss, they may still reach for a more potent and potentially dangerous option. So given this landscape, there's a few policy considerations to keep in mind. First, and this is similar to the indoor air quality issues, um, growing outside. Moving the grow outdoors or to a secure non-attached structure uh, on somebody's property would reduce the risk of children, pets, or adults coming into contact with the pesticide product. Um, but again, this, the same balance of risk comes into the conversation. So uh, while it certainly would help with pesticides, um, like I mentioned before, there are other things to keep in mind here. Second, we do really need to identify and promote low-risk products. Um, in the commercial cannabis sector, regulators both in Canada and the U.S. have taken aggressive action to get rid of some of those high-risk products, uh, which includes guidance and inspections and testings, and there have been quite a number of recalls and times as well. Um, but the thing is we need similar and appropriate efforts for home growers and the kinds of pesticides that they might use. Um, and at the minimum, products should be Approved, the, sorry, the products that are approved for commercial producers should actually be reevaluated for home use to see if it's still appropriate to be using them in those contexts. We also need product labeling that clearly indicates that it is for home use. Uh, and at the moment, people are reaching for pesticides that they assume would be fine to use on a cannabis plant because it's fine to use on a strawberry plant. Um, but you're potentially inhaling this pesticide, which you're not inhaling when you're consuming a strawberry. So some of those differences actually make a, a, a pretty um, big change in the risk in terms of exposure. So uh, something that is cannabis specific is going to go a long way. All right, let's turn to our electrical and fire hazards. Um, these risks are often linked to inappropriate or improperly installed equipment, uh, the presence of combustible materials uh, in the space, and also illegal cannabis processing. So there's, there's a trifecta here of different issues that are coming up. Um, first, high wattage grow lamps do produce enough heat to cause serious burns. They also draw a ton of power uh, that increases the risk of shocks and overload, which can lead to fire at the same time. Uh, homeowners have been known to exacerbate these risks by installing large circuit breakers to avoid power interruptions or by messing with the home's wiring. And, and both of those things obviously can have issues for fire risks as well. Um, other fire hazards include the presence of fertilizers, compressed gas for that CO2 generation that I mentioned earlier. Uh, as well as the accumulation of a lot of dried plant material. So you put all of those things into a small space and, and that is a recipe for a fire. If there is a fire, once the fire starts, having those items there um, it also increases the risk of explosion and it also decreases the time to escape. So because of these and other physical and structural hazards, home grows are considered more risky to first responders than typical residential fires. 
um, and presumably also to the occupants in need of rescue. So all of those things combined is, is really not a great situation. A second component of the electrical and fire hazard story is illegal cannabis processing. Uh, this is very, very hazardous and poses additional risks to burns, fire, and explosions. Um, but under the, the Act, individuals are, individuals are going to be allowed to process cannabis at home with some limitations. Um, actually, I think about a week after legalization in the fall, there was a house explosion. That's not the photo that I'm showing here, but there was a house explosion in, in Oshawa, Ontario, um, because somebody was doing just this, and it blew half the side of the house off just the, the same way that it, I'm shown in this photo here. These, these explosions are not small in any way. Um, even though cannabis concentrates can be produced a whole bunch of different ways, uh, extraction using butane or other organic solvents is, is a particular concern in this situation. Uh, just to give some background, the process involves literally blasting a pressurized organic solvent through kind of an open-ended tube or column that's been packed with cannabis, and then collecting the liquid that flows from the bottom, purging the solvent using a heat source, and then you get that kind of golden hash oil that I've shown at the top of the screen there. Um, despite the intense risks that come with this, they are, these oils are appealing for a couple of reasons. First is that they do have incredibly high potency, and, and in some cases up to 90% THC. Uh, second, it can be produced cheaply from the trimmings that would otherwise be discarded, uh, which lets home growers avoid that so-called waste that I mentioned earlier and maximize their return uh, on investment. So as the raw material becomes more available, uh, serious burn injuries due to hash oil explosions may increase, and we have seen that uh, in some of the states. From, for instance, just to give you a little bit of data here, from 2012 to 2017, uh, 30 hash oil-related incidents were investigated in Ontario alone. Uh, in BC, information from the Office of the Fire Commissioner showed that there were about 36 hash oil-related incidents over the same period. Um, in the states, Colorado had 29 cases from 2008 to 2014, and California had 101 cases from 20, 2007 to 2014. So here it's unclear yet what effect legalization is having on fire risk. Uh, and electrical risks and explosion risks um, since legalization, uh, but we are kind of trying to pay attention to that and see what the data is telling us if people are taking those risks. Um, certainly there have been a few explosions, but we don't know yet if it's gone off the charts the way that it has in some states um, or if it's in line with the kinds of explosions we've seen over the last 10 or 20 years. Uh, there are several approaches that might mitigate equipment-related electrical and fire risks, and, and first is to use municipal building electrical and fire codes or federal legislation to regulate the sale and installation of high water hydroponic systems. Um, second, we can encourage the use of lower risk equipment. So for example, LED lighting systems can reduce energy usage and heat output, and those that have been designed um, to help plant growth are actually just as effective as, as using some of those high wattage grow systems. When it comes to hash oil production, um, if we have no provisions for how people might try to process waste material, uh, and we don't have interventions aimed at reducing some of those explosions, uh, we really are going to see a problem, we expect. Though there are a couple factors that we can think about to get rid of this. It's, again, that raw material. Two, the severity of the legal consequences that come with processing illegally, and then access to legally produced regulated concentrates and oils um, that people can get without having to do that in their home. Finally, we can produce less hazardous methods in general. Um, we want to encourage people to use non-organic solvent-based extraction processes if they are going uh, to legalize or to produce concentrates. And I think that's part of the discussion is, is either using less hazardous practices or really talking about whether we should make these products available. Um, I think some of the debate circles around the fact that we don't really know as much about the health effects of just consuming some of those concentrates. So there is quite a lot of disagreement about whether they are too hazardous a product to legalize, and then it's being balanced with whether the practice of producing them at home is too hazardous to not legalize. So some of those states um, that have legalized home growth has, and have chosen to not sell concentrates have seen higher risk of explosions. Um, Washington State, on the other hand, has legalized the sale of those concentrates, and there have not been any explosions. So at the end of the day, uh, I think it's each of these different uh, public health uh, agencies in all of these regions are going to have those discussions, trying to balance 
uh, these risks. Okay, the last uh, environmental health risk here is uh, radiation. So grow lamps, like I, I mentioned before, um, they are intentionally used to produce high intensity UV light, which can either increase the THC content, uh, which is UV A or B, or to control fungal spores in the air on surfaces, which is UV C. It's fairly easy to access UV equipment, but it does mean that growers can tamper with the UV bulbs, uh, which, and by tamper, I mean they remove the filters uh, to increase UVC output. Uh, these practices can increase the risk of UV-related skin and eye damage, depending on the amount of time they're used and whether any shielding or personal protective equipment is used when you're in the growth space. Uh, several studies have identified increased health risks from exposure to UV in commercial grow ops, uh, including one that found that working for eight hours in a nursery would cause a worker to exceed the threshold limit value for UV by about ninefold, uh, which is not insignificant, um, and there are a few studies that have looked at this. Uh, risk and have found that it is problematic if you're in a grow space with this lights on. So here you can see a worker in a commercial facility uh, tending to the plants. He's got on some long sleeves and some sunglasses, which is great, but his neck and his head are unprotected. Uh, the hairnet and the sleeves, uh, incidentally, are actually to prevent the resinous sticking flower parts that I mentioned before from being contaminated with human hair. So it's, it's more to protect uh, the plants than to protect him. Uh, and that's something that we really do have to pay attention to when it comes to occupational health in some of these settings. So similarly to some of the hydroponic grow systems and the gas burners, um, UV emitting lamps are widely and commercially available for a variety of applications, including drinking water treatment and air purification, which are perfectly legitimate. Um, they also vary widely in quality and they may or may not be certified for a particular use. So at the moment, it, it really is the responsibility of the consumer to read and obey the manufacturer's recommendations on safe use of emit UV emitting products. To, to our knowledge, the potential risks of UV emitting devices have not been addressed in other jurisdictions outside of occupational settings. So that's the only data we have on this uh, at this point. Um, so it is worth doing uh, some digging to see if anybody else is doing studies uh, now that legalization has gone through. So now that we have been through some of the environmental health risks, I want to turn to public risk messaging. Um, because legalization here is still evolving and the interventions are limited and kind of inconsistent across the board, it is going to be very important to focus on proactive risk messaging uh, to address some of these EH risks of home growing. Um, as I mentioned throughout the policy consideration sections, enforcement is going to be challenging uh, even after regs and guidelines have been fully developed and implemented, which is going to make education campaigns and public discourse uh, on cannabis cultivation key to promoting health and safety at home. In our paper on home growing, we have developed a table, which I've put here, and you shouldn't be able to read it, so don't worry about that, um, with recommended public risk messages relating to each of the five environmental health risks that I talked about. Um, we've also put together a fact sheet that's only two pages long instead of our 20-page evidence review which goes over these same key messages and kind of does a brief summary of each environmental health risk so that it's easy to refer to and hand out to anybody that you might need to talk to about this. This slide is just an example of one of those sections of key messages. Uh, I've chosen indoor air quality just because it's something that people do tend to pay attention to uh, more than the others potentially. Um, here are some of the ideas that have been put forward by different agencies. We do want to encourage people to scale production according to the ventilation capacity of the home, uh, the sensitivity of the occupants to mold, which is to say are there asthmatics in the home, and then actually their ability to control odor, so how well is uh, the home ventilated as well. We want to encourage people to control humidity uh, by assessing and reducing moisture sources, restricting cultivation to a humidity controlled room, uh, and using a dehumidifier as required. Uh, we do want people to be vigilant for signs of dampness or mold and consult professionals as needed. Uh, monitor relative humidity using an inexpensive hygrometer. Dispose of mold infested plants safely and quickly. Consider those non-ignition ignition methods of CO2 enrichment. Um, and equip all homes with a CO detector, uh, regardless of whether cannabis is cultivated, particularly with home, homes that have fuel burning appliances. Um, and so if we stick to these types of messages that are really about risk reduction, uh, it is a part of that um, generalized CPHA message to encourage conversation on consumption, and we want people to get talking about this so they can share different interventions that they themselves can implement to kind of reduce some of these risks. 
Now, there are some challenges to risk messages, to risk messaging when it comes to cannabis. Um, we do want to talk about how we can craft health communications that do adequately and fairly inform the user of risk to themselves and others. Um, we want to reduce harms to those who choose to use, and we don't want to rely on stereotypes, fear, or stigma. Um, most of this work, or much of this work, rather, in cannabis and in other uh, drug policies has grown out of um, the standard risk messaging that's used in emergency situations, so floods, wildfires, et cetera. And the main tenet of this approach of uh, risk communication is basically that be first, be right, be credible. We want public health to be able to uh, fill those roles. Um, we want to be using simple, plain, appropriate language, and we want to make sure we target the right audience for the right message. So if we're talking about home growing, we want to provide risk messages to adults about indoor air quality. We do want to direct communications about CO2 detectors to neighborhood groups um, rather than during education campaigns targeted at youth about managing harms from consumption. We want to be very, very focused and specific about who those messages are getting to, um, homes that have children in them, for instance. We want information to be posted places like Home Depot or City Hall or anywhere people might be buying supplies. Um, and thinking through all of those options is going to be pretty important to getting uh, those messages across the right groups. At the same time, we have to acknowledge um, the limits of the evidence that we have. Uh, our knowledge of cannabis risk is incomplete, uh, and it, there's no harm in saying that. In fact, it's much better to be upfront about that. Having Legalization Canada now does greatly facilitate research, so that does give us a way to get more information about what's going on and what the different hazards might be. Unfortunately, even in surveys that have been conducted in the last two to three years, public health is still accused and perceived to have a bit of reefer hysteria, as it were. Um, and so keeping that in mind when delivering messages uh, is pretty important, and we can't really uh, overstate in any way uh, the information that we have because it, it will just solidify that, um, that perception and it will make it more difficult for these more moderate uh, risk reduction messages to get across. Sticking to what we clearly do know, we can talk about cannabis and not just age risk in a couple of ways. We know pretty sure, pretty for sure at this point that uh, inhaling particulates and polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, so PAHs, is bad um, regardless of what you're smoking. So we can be sure about that message uh, and we don't have to back away from it in any way. Careless use and storage can lead to child and pet poisonings. There is a ton of data out there that suggests uh, that that is happening and that that has been a problem for a long time. Driving while impaired is dangerous. Again, it's dangerous activity regardless of what has impaired you, so we can be clear about that. And then there are smart and not smart ways to grow cannabis at home, and there are clear ways that uh, people can reduce the risk that um, they are exposed to potentially if they do want to undertake personal cultivation. So what can we do to reduce environmental health risks overall from personal cultivation? First and foremost, I want to acknowledge Clearly that there are uncertainties, not just generally for cannabis, but in the home growing context. Mostly this is about the magnitude and duration of the risks, because it really depends on how many people choose to grow at home, how big those growths get, and how many people actually stick through, through with it. Is it going to be like my parents and their neighbors like chuckling about like a cannabis plant that they've grown between the raspberry cane? We don't know. We don't know if that's the issue. Um, that we're going to get stuck with, and then maybe the burden of disease is pretty small. Um, but if we do have a much greater scale and a much larger group of people who decide to stick with it, that means these risks potentially uh, pose a larger uh, health risk across the population. We do definitely want to focus on surveillance here. The poison control center data is critical, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning. We want to incentivize safe practices and get those messages to the public. Um, Safety campaigns should consider cannabis in all its forms, including raw plant material products, all those concentrates, edibles, joints, and the waste. Uh, safe practices should include secure storage, least, least risky means of processing and appropriate disposal. There is some ideas, there are some ideas floating around about municipalities or provinces promoting and distributing cannabis safety kits targeted towards home growers, uh, particularly those homes with children. With, and the kits might contain something like stickers with a standardized cannabis symbol child-resistant bags or lock boxes, locked to install in cupboards, and most importantly, first aid and contact information for the local poison control center. I do also want to point out that uh, interest in cannabis legalization might serve to increase engagement around other long-standing public health issues that are not at all unique to cannabis. So these are issues like humidity and indoor mold, um, the dangers of carbon monoxide, safe use of pesticides, particularly indoors, uh, and indoor air quality more generally. So 
For example, if we include carbon monoxide poisoning in cannabis risk messaging, that might help to increase general awareness and safety, particularly if homeowners do install CO detectors. So maybe those cannabis safety kits also come with a humidity monitor and a CO detector. And then we eliminate some of those issues that um, they might not necessarily have uh, really ever acted upon if cannabis weren't a part of the picture. So I think we can leverage some of this interest to help make people a little bit more aware um, of the issues in their home to begin with. Uh, I haven't mentioned this today at all, but another big component of the environmental health issue is edibles, especially in terms of uh, contamination, uh, pesticides, concentration, different types of microbial concentration, THC levels, et cetera. Um, and the NCCH is hoping to work on this in the coming year so that there's some information by the time that uh, issue comes to the legalization forefront next fall. I put some references on the slide if you'd like to look through them. And as Stephanie mentioned, there are going to be links available somewhere in this uh, Adobe meeting area um, for you to click on either the fact sheet or the evidence review, as well as these slides directly. But if you do want the bit.ly, I have put one on the slide here for you to be able to access. We do have that cannabis topic page that I mentioned, which has a whole bunch of other resources, not big written documents that uh, we've put together, but we do tend to curate lists of things that are useful um, for different groups. So do check that out. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to email me, and I'm happy to answer some questions now if we've got some time. So thank you very much for listening. Okay, great. Thanks so much, Leela. Um, very detailed and great current information. Um, Definitely enjoyed, you know, those identifications of the gaps and some of those policy considerations um, to really hear it from the environmental health perspective. That was really great. Um, we do have time for questions, so I do have a few that have already been typed in, but for anyone else out there, please take the time. You can type it in the Q&A or the chat box, whichever you prefer, um, and we'll just go through those um, one by one. Um, I must say, though, it's glad to hear that your pup is okay. Um, oh my gosh, that must have been a scare. <laughs> so the first one that I'm seeing in this chat box is, can there be allergen issues? Um, I'm tr I feel like I saw that pop up when I was talking about odor. Uh, is that, can somebody clarify that? I mean, either way, I can, I can, just, I, I know personally people who have allergen issues to cannabis. Um, they're certainly a budding plant. Um, they have flowers. So I suspect that that is potentially an issue. The thing is, I don't think it's specific to any kind of um, cannabis drug or consumption. Like, there's, there's not going to be like a hallucinogenic effect from an allergen. It will just be like a, a similar reaction that you might have um, to any kind of other plant that you might be allergic to, so a ragweed or, or anything else that has um, the spores going out into the air. Uh, I don't think that there were any allergen issues identified via odor. Uh, in that evidence review that PHO did last summer. It certainly didn't come up otherwise. Uh, they would have flagged it potentially as an actual health issue um, that needs to be considered. So I think it, it's not uh, something that a neighbor could potentially say, I can smell the cannabis and I'm allergic and thus it's an environmental health threat. I think that that's the same as somebody planting like ragweed in the backyard. Um, not that anybody would intentionally plant ragweed, but um, no, I haven't, I haven't seen anything specifically about odor being uh, linked to allergen issues. Uh, the next one I see is, with legalization of edibles, do we know what the government intends to do with the 20 registered pesticides? More precisely, do we know if the 20 authorized have been tested for consumption as food and not only uh, to be inhaled? No, because those pesticides, like I said, are not synthetic. So they're pretty docile as chemicals go. Um, you could do either with them. Um, the, the oils and the salters and the detergents, like the consumption versus the inhalation is not uh, the huge issue with those. Uh, and because it's the, it's the uh, synthetic pesticides that are more problematic in terms of roots of exposure. Um, so I don't know yet what they're doing. The problem is that we don't have pesticides that have been specifically designed or approved for use on cannabis plants um, that are part of that list that are a part of the list that uh, people can actually use because they're potent. So that's definitely an area that needs to be done in, a, in, in short order. Um, there has been some investigative journalism, actually, that has gone out to test edible products in some of the um, dis dispensaries, as they're called, in Toronto, of different edible products to see what concentration levels there are um, of pesticides in, in kind of things like gummies and lozenges. 
Um, and actually, they haven't found pesticides levels that are much higher than expected in a, a product that's been concentrated like that. The bigger issue seems to be the fact that the THC levels are inconsistent with what they are labeled as. Upwards is like 50 to 60 percent more than what they're labeled as, or 50 to 60 percent less than what they're labeled as. So actually, that has been coming up more and more uh, as part of the edible issue. I do think that the pesticide issue is going to be a problem um, in terms of concentration in different food products. Uh, but I think the biggest problem is that we don't have any of them uh, that have been kind of given the green light to be used on cannabis that are part of that synthetic list. Uh, the next question here is, following the above question, do we know if making extracts will concentrate also the pesticides used in the culture? Uh, that Yes, we do know that because we have been able to see that if you're making a concentrate product, if you're making a hash oil, those pesticides do concentrate up. So yes, that's absolutely uh, something that we've seen um, in the hash oils that we've um, gotten evidence from in the states that have gone through that process, for sure. They absolutely concentrate the same way uh, other, other, other chemicals would concentrate. Is there a resource that can provide guidance for waste management disposal of cannabis waste, including parts of the plant? Um, like I mentioned, Health Canada did release those resources um, for medicinal cannabis waste. Uh, a few years ago, which was about mixing it with the cat litter and putting it in a blender and putting it in organic waste. But the thing is, most of this is going to come down to what different municipalities decide. Um, the Canadian Association, or what is it called? Canadian Association of Association of Canadian Municipalities. I don't remember the acronym. I'm sorry. Um, they came out with a very big document uh, last summer as well that we collaborated with them on. Uh, and we did bring up this waste disposal thing, so I think that they are trying to get as much information as they can from their different partners and from the municipalities that are part of that unit altogether to see what different uh, cities are planning on doing. Unfortunately, I don't think there's one guidance document across the board because every municipality can decide to do differently uh, or just decide to deal with this issue differently. I wish that there was a resource out there that would um, lay out some of the the different approaches, but unfortunately it doesn't exist at this point. I think each city is kind of dealing with it on their own um, with like weigh in from the provinces. Um, if I get a resource like that, it will certainly be going on our topic page um, because the more and more larger resources that we have that are a bit more comprehensive, the better. Um, just to, I'm going to get to the next question in a second, but in terms of resources that are across Canada, another thing that's coming up, which has, has nothing to do with environmental health risks, but I'm going to mention it anyway. Um, is signage, which is about consumption, and we do talk quite about it, a bit about it in the paper that I mentioned that's coming out um, imminently in Environmental Health Review, is that there actually is no guidance right now to municipalities on how to sign where it's appropriate to smoke cannabis and where it's not. So people are taking very, very different tacks. They're not getting any instruction from the provinces or the feds on what those signs need to look like, what kind of information needs to be included. Do we say no smoking cannabis like on 99 signs around the town and, and then don't put, and then just assume people can smoke in all places where there are no signs? Or do we put signs up that say cannabis smoking allowed here and then everywhere else it's not allowed because you only had to put up one sign that said it's allowed here? Um, there really is no guidance. The colors, the, the signs, like the images, are we using joints on these signs? Are we using like little vaporizers? Is there a cannabis leaf? It's really up to the, the municipalities and their guidance uh, that they're getting from designers, which is not really what we want to have happen. We'd like public health to be able to weigh in and say this is the way to get these messages across in a, in a clear fashion. Um, and we reached out to a couple of cities that had put up signs, uh, and they were just thrilled that anybody was paying attention to it at all because they haven't been getting any top-down um, guidance. So that's similar to the guidance on waste management disposal. I think it is something that we do have to get together on uh, and have a bit of a more coordinated strategy for us. Uh, the next question is, what are the health risks of raw plant waste? I understand that heating is required to activate THG. Uh, well, it depends who is eating it. Um, animals certainly could have reactions to it. I think it's not necessarily THG that does the poisoning uh, all the time. So there's all sorts of different compounds in those plants. It's the same as eating any plant material in some ways. Um, it's really not great for you. And if it's left around, uh, children and pets are going to chew on it. Um, especially depending on how it's been processed. If you're talking about, if it's just like random leaves that's different, the children aren't necessarily going to chew on house plants the way that animals will. Um, but if it's been chopped up, it's been processed, if it looks like hashish, if it looks like lumps of anything, like delicious, it can certainly um, cause health issues. 
And I think one of the other concerns is that if you're throwing out plant waste that is just a full leaf, people can pick them up off the street and then decide to make their own concentrates from it. So I think that's why Health Canada advised originally for you to blend it up in cat litter and water because nobody can process anything useful out of that at that point. Um, but if you're just throwing like bushels of leaves into your organic bin, and my organic bin like sits right on the almost at the sidewalk, anybody can come by and like take a look inside all these bins, especially if it's clear from something on your property that you're growing plants in the backyard or you can see them from the window. That's another thing that uh, some regions have made clear that you may be you may grow outside, but they can't be publicly visible. So, for instance, in BC, even if you uh, are growing inside, you can't visibly see the plants from the window because it does tip people off that you might have some waste products that you're ditching uh, at regular intervals. Um, so that's another thing that uh, is it kept in mind when it comes to the waste. It's not just like consuming the raw leaves. It's the fact that people can take those leaves um, and make something out of it. There seems to be uh, some other q and I'm seeing in a different box. Should I click to expand that, Stephanie? Oh, no, this is uh, the same question. No, actually, great. We we got them all, so thank you very much. Oh, um, great. That was, yeah, so thank you so much. If there is any last questions, please type it in quickly. Um, I just want to make sure that I draw everybody's attention to the web link. It should be visible now where you can download the presentation, the evidence review, and the fact sheet that Lila was speaking about. These are all links that are actually going to bring you right back to the NCCH's page. Um, so, you know, that's a great place, as she was saying, to come back and check for some things that are eminently being released. So that's fantastic. Thank you for that heads up. Um, so what we'll do now is I'll just kind of take that with me. But uh, we'll just wrap up and we'll just kind of get to... Um, Again, thank you very much, uh, Leela. That was fantastic. And thank you to everyone who participated today. It absolutely was uh, great information. Again, the webinar was recorded and will be posted online at our YouTube channel. Um, CPHA does have our Cannabis Weekly updates. And if you're not already registered, there's a link to sign up there, um, as well as some of our resource pages. So again, thank you so much. Um, take a few minutes. You can um, answer our last polls or provide maybe some information as from your perspective, was there anything, other um, the resources or information that you were looking for? That'd be really helpful. We can add that in. And again, I think what I'm going to do then is I'm just going to bring back the web links in case anybody was needing that. Um, and we'll leave it there. So again, thank you again, everybody. I will leave the room open to allow you some time to finish off the polls. Um, if there's any last uh, questions, uh, please let us know. And um, again, thank you all so much for participating today. Thanks so much for listening and thanks for having me.